the spiritual dessert truths for Russell Brand and other people, episode 71. I found some nice little video clips from the Strand Bookstore where Russell was reading from this book, <laughs> which I love. Um, so I figured he already read from that spot, so it might be legal <laughs> to share that spot. Um, it was very personable and funny and adorable. There was this tiny, tiny little three or four year old child and he, he was just adorable. I mean, <laughs> he says he would make a good parent, but I beg to differ. First of all, he can handle anybody. Did you see him on BBC? <laughs> It just made me ridiculously happy. <laughs> I am glitzy and glowing and in my fun, wildest, happy hat, <laughs> which I usually wear to paint kids. Um, yes, I do sort of theatrical airbrush makeup that looks sort of like Cirque du Soleil and kids love it. <laughs> yeah, so if you want to see my shiny face. <laughs> find me. <laughs> I paint on kids. And uh, they're very quiet. They're very attentive. <laughs> they're very funny. Very sweet. And they have got lots of ideas and lots of opinions if you, you know, ask them. Uh, they're extremely smart. And I think they just pop out of heaven with those wise little eyes and the gigantic heads and tiny little morph body. <laughs> yeah. And they're always sleeping. It's probably because their spirit just wants to go back back to heaven, back to paradise. It's so <laughs> much different energy here. So, uh, without further ado, uh, Russell. <laughs> Above the surface, knowing you will make a false move, waiting. Then snap, thrash, roll, you're finished. He eats home secretaries for breakfast, shits chancellors, and wipes his ass on prime ministers. If, if he's a darling, don't negotiate with him, he's a little kid. Like, you can't negotiate. Just give him a break. Yeah, well done, love. I'm not, I don't need to chastise you. I'm a terrible parent. Whenever kids like, if I'm looking after a kid and he goes, I want ice cream, I go, no, 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 you got vegetables. He goes, ice cream. Oh, no, vegetables, vegetables. And he goes, ice cream. I go, all right, fuck it, ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> I've already grown. My, my organs are all functioning. Thank you. Well done. Good responsible parenting. <laughs> and do come back in and I'll sign your book and I'll sign a children's book for you. It won't be mine because it's not out yet. Just we'll grab one from the store. <laughs> Which we will then pay for legitimately because the staff have been so good. <laughs> okay, so Jeremy Paxman. He eats home secretaries for breakfast, shits chancellors, and wipes his ass on prime ministers. In five minutes' time, I will be interviewed by Jeremy on our nation's foremost news analysis show, Newsnight. That's why I'm on my knees now in the toilet at the lobby at the Landmark Hotel praying. God, make me a channel of your peace. The first line from the St. Francis Prayer, popularised by Mother Teresa, bastardised by Margaret Thatcher, and cherished by those of us who have fallen through the cracks and float ourselves back up with crack. I just, want to be, I just want to be a channel of the peace. The peace exists. I don't need, thank God, to create the peace. All I have to do is become open and the peace will come. The peace is already there. Mother Teresa, one could argue, is a testimony to the principles outlined in this prayer. Through service, she conquered the lower selfish drives that serve survival and ego and has become a tool of a higher purpose or God. Margaret Thatcher's case is less clear. What God she was serving in her systematic destruction of the values of our country as she jived in the brilliant teen shadow of Ronnie Reagan is a mystery. But as she stands, newly elected and spattered by foreboding rain outside number 10, it is the St. Francis prayer that Maggie recites. Actually, we don't need that bit, right? Perfect. <laughs> Lord, make me a channel of thy peace, that where there is hatred, I may bring love, that where there is wrong, I may bring the spirit of forgiveness, that where there is discord, I may bring harmony, that where there is error, I may bring truth, that where there is doubt, I may bring faith, that where there is despair, I may bring hope, that where there are shadows, I may bring light, that where there is sadness, I may bring joy. Lord, grant that I may seek rather to comfort than to be comforted, to understand than to be understood, to love than to be loved. For it is by self-forgetting that one finds, it is by forgiving that one is forgiven, it is by dying that one awakens to eternal life. Amen. 
Now, I don't think she built it out the whole thing there and then, but you don't need to be Jeremy Paxman to see that Margaret Thatcher somewhat strayed from the sentiments outlined in this prayer. She didn't bring much love to the miners of Northern England. She wasn't that forgiving to the Argentinian sailors on the Belgrano. There was very little harmony among the poll tax rioters and the police. You get the idea. So I suppose the prayer is not infallible. In the wrong hands, it can evidently become a mantra for self-centred nihilism. That ain't the prayer's fault, though. For me, it's a code that attunes my mind to its natural state. Union, connection, oneness. In the Creole ramblings that I offer up in the frantic laboratorial incantations that precede the interview, some Vedic chants, yogic murmurs, and even some Eminem lyrics, what I'm trying to do is connect, transcend, get out of myself. That's what I've been trying to do my whole life. Get out of myself, get out of my mind, get out of grace, get out of the feeling that I'm not good enough, that I'm alone, that I'm never going to be happy or loved. And I've tried to do it in a multitude of ways, always with the same outcome. I've greeted a cavalcade of gleaming false idols like a jam jar native prostrate before the great white master. As a little boy, chocolate and television were deities to me. I sat on my knees before that goggle box in spellbound devotion. The penguin sacrament, it's an English biscuit. It's candy, it's an English biscuit. Ritualistically devoured, nibble chocolate coat in first, scrape centre with teeth, then eat biscuit. As a teen with porn, I was locked up, mute like a trappist in the bathroom, flagellating with stifled wails. With drugs and alcohol, I made the pilgrimage to any bridge or corner and made my donations in the penury my God demanded. Then came fame where I studied like Augustine and voyaged like a Jesuit. I was a zealous devotee to every prophet of the panoply and none bore anything but pain and disillusion. Only when salvation was offered did I become circumspect. Only when the solution became available did I examine with a sceptical eye. When I next five quid bottles of vodka I did not read the label. When I scored rocks and bags off tumbleweed hobos blowing through the no man's land of Hackney estates, I conducted no litmus tests. As I sought sanctuary in the twilight cemeteries, entombed in strangers' limbs, I barely even asked their names. But when the true dawn came, when the light rose, when I felt the fusion, I had no faith, I had questions. And in the inquisitor's chair, in the studio, come suite of the Landmark Hotel, so does Jeremy Paxman. So, he says, in a voice so intoned with sarcasm, I wonder whether it will come out of his nose. How, if you think people shouldn't vote, are we going to change the world? Through revolution, I say. You want a revolution? Yeah. You believe there's going to be a revolution? He shunts the question at me like a billiard ball. Jeremy, I have no doubt, I reply. Jeremy has been round the block a few times and has sat across from every Johnny come lately mug with a cause and a plug who has got the gall to crop up in his show in the last 20 years. He looks me up and down, the hair, the beard, the ridiculous scarf. <laughs> and how, may I ask, is this revolution going to come about? Now that is a very good question. It's a question that far less skilled interviewers than Jeremy Paxman would lob at you. But this ain't a far less skilled one. It's Paxman. And not just Paxman. It's my headmaster. It's the arresting officer. It's the people at work. Friends, relatives, well-wishers and bystanders. How will this revolution work? How can we change the world? How can we change ourselves? Can we really overthrow the corrupt and the powerful? Not just the corruption in society, but the corruption in ourselves. Well, I know the answer is yes. And as for the more complicated aspects of that question, well, I may not be Margaret Thatcher, and I'm certainly no Mother Teresa, except we agree on condoms, but <laughs> I've given it some thought. So here we go. Sit down and strap in. That is the prologue of my book, Revolution. Thank you very much for coming here. Yay! <laughs> I really do love this book. I think you should buy it, because I can't read it all in bits and pieces, and it wouldn't be fair. The book is called... Revolution. <laughs> Love you. Pleasant dreams. Or maybe it's not anywhere near <laughs> pleasant dreams where you are yet. Have a nice morning, day, afternoon, evening, and maybe a nice sleep. Love you. <laughs> thanks for doing this book. Thanks for doing this show. And thanks for doing this book tour. And thanks for making New York one of the first stops. Yay, Strand. <laughs> Mwah, mwah, mwah.